What is up, Buck? I'm Doug with DNA in the Garage, and today I'm going to tell you a story. It's a story of a problem solver who ultimately became a problem for some powerful people and may or may not have gotten solved himself. This is the story of the man who chased the 100% efficiency engine and in doing so brought us the other white meat of internal combustion the mighty mighty diesel. For his trouble innovating a torque happy low revving high efficiency engine which ran on a low temp byproduct of crude oil, he was rewarded with riches, fame, and possibly a shortened lifespan. Today we discuss Rudolph Diesel, the engine he innovated, and the ideas that may have gotten him killed. Let's get into it. Rudolph Christian Carl Diesel was born March 18th, 1858 to Bavarian parents living in Paris. Unfortunately, young Rudolph had a relatively unstable childhood as his father struggled to retain gainful employment, splitting his time between Paris, Bavaria, and London, often living with family other than his parents. Thankfully, during this time, he develops an interest in learning and specifically an interest in engineering. This takes him to the Royal Bavarian Polytechnical Institute where he meets Professor Carl von Lind. During one of Carl von Lind's lectures, a young Rudolf Diesel is introduced to the idea of the Carnot cycle. Now, the Carnot cycle I wasn't able to get a strong enough grasp on it, I don't mind telling you, to feel comfortable giving you guys a concise explanation. But basically, it's a zero friction, 100% efficiency motor. It's hypothetical, I guess. Google it if you think you have the chops. As Lind explains this in his lecture to the class and Rudolph hears it, he becomes extremely interested in the Carnot cycle, but in super efficient engines in general. For context, steam engines of the day were like six to 11% efficient. That's all that steam you see escaping, that's all loss of potential energy. It's around this time that Diesel starts tinkering with his own high efficiency engines, first starting with an ammonia steam engine, which sounds like a terrible idea to me and ultimately it was because the thing blew up and sent him to hospital for a few months he was nearly blind nearly killed and he had to be recovered from this thing and that took him away from steam engines it also took him to take a job with Lind who had left academia and started his own refrigeration company in France one that is still operational today Lind refrigeration is a company that has been around since the time of Rudolf Diesel. It's around this time that Diesel develops his own idea for a high efficiency thermal engine. What he wants to do is create what he calls a compression ignition engine. It's a four cycle engine. You draw fuel in on an intake stroke, subsequently compress it on a compression stroke. At the top of that compression stroke, the compressed gases have reached enough of a heat through compression that they spontaneously ignite, creating a power stroke, an exhaust stroke, and then you start it all over again. Those that know what I just described. Diesel engine, duh. Through the early 1890s, Diesel messes around with a couple different iterations of this engine. Finally, in 1895, Rudolf Diesel develops the very first fully operational prototype for a compression ignition diesel engine. Enter the 25400. This is a water-cooled, single-cylinder, low-speed, four-stroke, crankless engine with a crosshead piston. It has a bore of 250 millimeters and a piston stroke of 400 millimeters, giving it a displacement of 19.6 liters. Single cylinder, 19.6 liters. If that don't get you diesel boys excited, I don't know what will. While this very first operational diesel engine does have its issues, it impresses enough industrialists and fellow engineers that people begin to license the designs from Diesel. He's able to patent his designs and he begins to make a lot of money off of diesel engines while diesel engines begin to spread. Initially, they go in to replace steam engines in a factory because the best way to make them efficient is to make them as big as possible and as low speed as possible, as low RPM. That's how you make a diesel as efficient as possible. It's worth noting his original prototype of the 25400 still exists in a museum in Munich where it runs to this day. 
Gotta love German engineering. Speaking of that prototype, it's worth noting that the initial prototype that Diesel created was extremely reliable because it was constantly serviced, constantly maintenanced, and it existed in a controlled environment. Unfortunately, when these initial licensed manufactured versions make it out there, they have some issues because they're replacing steam engines and they're being treated like steam engines, which means they're being overloaded, under maintenance and they're generally just being run by crews and operators that don't know what they're doing because this is the first diesel engine everywhere they're coming from steam that's the only thing they know that's not a horse so these initial diesel engines do have some issues but the benefits are immediately observable and they make their way into just about every application where power generation is a need you're seeing them used in trains in boats in submarines in generators in factories in 1923 Benz makes the first diesel powered truck. It's a five ton, 45 horsepower cargo truck. And the rest is diesel history. But this is not a video on diesel the engine. This is a video on diesel the man. Let's return to our protagonist. Now, Diesel the Man was not just interested in the engines, but he was interested in the fuels these engines could burn. It's interesting to note that they were running their diesels on kerosene, but today we recognize diesels can be run on petroleum diesel. They can be run on biodiesel, SVO or straight vegetable oil, used vegetable oil, blue crude based fuel, dimethyl ether or DME, or of course, kerosene, some Albertan Fords are even known to run on used motor oil and so-called radioactive goat piss. Now being a student of efficiencies of all kinds, Diesel wanted to know what's the best fuel that we should be putting through these new diesel engines. And he came up with the idea that if we could come up with a fuel that we can grow, instead of one we have to mine? We could have a situation where a country's government and civilian populations maintain a fleet of diesel-powered vehicles and an agricultural sector that grows the fuel for all those vehicles, making each country energy independent. Wow. In addition to being a fan of efficiency of all kinds, Diesel was not a nationalist, and it makes sense. He was a Bavarian descent, born in Paris, lived in London. So he didn't really care who he helped with his diesel engine and that's illustrated the first Navy to use diesels in submarines were the French, aided directly by diesel in 1905. And that's sort of where the good news for diesel ends for today. September 29th, 1913, Rudolf Diesel boards the SS Dresden in Antwerp, Belgium, bound for London. He's going to England to try to sell his patents to English companies, as well as speak directly with the British Navy about getting diesel engines into their submarines. That night, he retires to his cabin, and the next morning, he's nowhere to be found. They find his coat and his hat folded neatly next to the railing at the aft of the ship. In his cabin, they find his diary. The entry for the date, September 29th, 1913, is nothing but a cross. It is assumed that Rudolf Diesel has taken his own life. After his death, we learned that unfortunately, he was in some pretty deep financial trouble. Even though he'd made a ton of money from the early diesel engines, he'd made bad investments with that money and the rest of it he'd lost trying to pacify customers of those low quality, high issue, early models. It came out after his death that before he left for this trip, he gave his wife a bag. He told her to open it after he left. Inside that bag was $20,000. It didn't make sense until it did, and the more people read into his past, the more people were willing to accept that this troubled genius had taken his own life. Theory number two, the Deutsch bags did it. 19 teens in Europe is categorized by a web of intermingling and competing alliances and treaties, and it's a time of extreme nationalism among countries that have just industrialized extremely quickly. Everybody is concerned with having the biggest and the most sharp pointy sticks. Now diesel's going around to European countries revolutionizing naval technology, bringing diesel power to submarines. Now Wilhelm II, who is in control of a very, very strong German federation and kind of gets the feeling that he may be at war with some of these people in the next few years, feels that this 
German technology, Diesel's German name, shouldn't be shared with all the allies. It should be retained within Germany. So Wilhelm II has his agents follow Rudolf to Antwerp and neutralize him before he can further spread this Bavarian technology around the world, strengthening Wilhelm II's enemies. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Theory number three, don't mess with big oil. Between 1900 and 1913, Diesel is extremely vocal about alternative fuel sources. At this time, he's actually working on a prototype that would run on straight vegetable oil and nothing else. This is Diesel bringing his idea full circle. It's a logical jump for a man who is obsessed with efficiency, but... This means that Diesel was actively innovating for and pursuing a world where big oil, i.e. John D. Rockefeller, would begin to lose market share and ultimately would take a back seat to the emerging automotive trend instead of fueling it. The ones and twos of this one are that John D. Rockefeller, or more likely a Pinkerton agency type figure, pursued Diesel to Antwerp and neutralized him to prevent his next big move, that move away from crude oil and towards a German utopia where Iowa is now the biggest automotive fuel producing state and Texas is known for tumbleweeds and tacos. Friends, it's extremely hard to say what fate befell the genius of compression ignition. Did he relieve himself of what he deemed a hopeless financial circumstance? Or was he sacrificed at the altar of early 20th century nationalism? Or in the name of an American tycoon's insatiable appetite for supremacy? For certain, we can assume that Rudolf Diesel would be pleased to see the innumerable applications modern man has found for his high efficiency diesel engines. I'd like to conduct a thought experiment. Close your eyes if you please Please, and imagine this world. Imagine if we'd begun down the path of biodiesel over 100 years ago. Think about how much advancement the gasoline internal combustion engine has enjoyed because of its prominence and dominance as the people mover and people destroyer of the 20th century. Imagine a world where instead of paying farmers to not grow corn this year, or finding obnoxious and counterproductive places to stuff our surplus corn, like petroleum gasoline, where it causes way more unintended consequences than it does good. Imagine instead we had been developing the agricultural and industrial means to be 100% self-sufficient as a country with a completely renewable resource, fueling our cars, heating our homes, and generating our electricity. That is the future that was stolen from us on September 29th, 1913. Personally, as a student of history and the occasional purveyor of a tin hat theory or two, I like the diesel had to go so that crude oil could safely power our cars theory. It definitely has some holes, but so do the others. Let's look for ourselves. The Kaiser did not do it because there was no real gain. Rudolf Diesel's patents had expired in 1912 and copies of his engine, better copies, were already everywhere. So there was nothing to be gained outside of punishing him for daring to not keep his Bavarian technology Bavarian. I know Germans and grudges, but it seems like a long way to go for the Kaiser and his men to really not stop anything because it's not like the brits didn't have diesel subs during world. everyone everyone who wanted diesel subs during world war one had diesel subs they didn't need rudolph diesel to do that because the patent had already expired gleaning truth on a man's mental state through 110 year old sources is basically impossible the smoking gun of the diary and the clothes could just as easily have been planted there by an attacker to show that diesel went overboard and did not leave the ship through other means now personally i believe that diesel would have stuck around to see the biodiesel thing through it seems like he was at the cusp of really getting people to make some changes and putting these things in place diesel engines were proliferating they were beginning to show up everywhere. It was a good thing that his patent ran up because now he could pursue the biodiesel thing and let other people make the engines, is my humble opinion. But what do you guys think? Was it the Kaiser, Rockefeller, or Diesel who ultimately ended Rudolph Diesel? And more importantly, what would Rudy have thought about 12 inch wides, chrome tips, and rolling coal? Friends, that is all there is to it. I'd love it if you'd leave me a comment down in the squawk boxes. Who undid Diesel? 
and why. If you like the video, like the video. Maybe go check out my website, monkeywiththetoolbox.com. I'm very happy to let you know that we've just worked out the next run of the four liter tribute hoodie, currently unavailable, will be going up for sale on February 1st. We do have a couple more from the previous run to fulfill, so if you're still waiting for yours, it is on its way. Otherwise, check monkeywiththetoolbox.com February 1st. If you wanna get your hands on this one, and I've heard your emails, I've heard your comments. When we do the next run of these sweatshirts, we'll do at least 3X. Other than that, thanks so much for watching. I cannot wait to see y'all on the next one.